Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Bill Clark. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Bill Walster. I've worked with uh, briefly in the past and hopefully we'll do more in the future. Bill is going to be um, talking to us about, I, I guess, presenting a business case for why Google should be um, doing work on interval computing. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill. I'm delighted to be here. Um, uh, as uh, Bill said, um, it seems to me as though there's a, a, a big opportunity uh, for Google in numerical computing. And in this talk, uh, I'll make some statements about applied mathematics, numerical analysis, and computing that might be new to you, or some of you anyway. Uh, I don't know how much time we'll have to go into great detail. I, kept the talk sort of at a high level. Uh, but everything I say is, of course, true. And I'll be happy to answer questions uh, either now or at any time about any of this. So let's begin with something I believe you will all think is true, namely that um, uh, Google is a leader, if not the leader, in providing its users with access to computers in ways that make them productive. Increasing user productive productivity has been a constant motivation for innovations in computing over the years. Early on uh, in the history of computing, and that sort of continues, productivity uh, was and has been primarily achieved through increases in speed. But speed alone doesn't make users produ productive. With increased speed, <coughs> more resources get to be devoted toward e ease of use. Examples early on started with Fortran, higher level languages were a big uh, increase in productivity. Then came C, C++, Java, Python, and others. In addition, there's been, a, been constant progress in operating systems as well as symbolic mathematics. Uh, starting with Maxima, Reduce, Maple, Mathematica, and MuPen. The graphical user interface, or GUI, was a watershed that provided easy access to computing for many non-technical users. However, long sequences of mouse clicks can be a trap. Uh, power users tend to still want to use procedures and scripts uh, to automate things. Uh, unfortunately, many applications don't have both a command line and a GUI interface, which sometimes can be a problem. But nevertheless, with all these innovations and advances in tools and operating systems uh, came added complexity in the form of layer upon layer upon layer of options. While options create flexibility for users and revenue for vendors, um, they can also create daunting learning curves for uh, beginners. What's needed in user interfaces is flexibility so that new users can start with a, a GUI, get productive work done quickly, but then as they need more options, they can find them and use them. And then finally, when they need to, to be quote unquote power users, they can automate uh, their work. Done well, automation can raise the level of abstraction used to perform work. That is, when sets of tasks are identified that have a, a small interface, a new task can be created out of them. Uh, this process can then be repeated uh, and layers upon layers of new constructs uh, can be uh, developed that have more and more power. Increasing the level of abstraction in which work is defined and performed is one of the most important characteristics of mathematics and numerical computing because it's a key to increasing both productivity and creativity. People can not only work in higher levels of abstraction, but they can think in them as well. So user productivity continues to be a constant driver of innovation in computing. No wonder Google appears to be focused on user productivity. 
Google is leading the way to the next level of increased productivity by providing simple, easy to use, web-based applications. In these applications, only those features that users require need to be provided because Google's business model appears to not require a constant stream of feature releases that users might or might not want. Moreover, Google also appears more than capable of providing sufficient speed, if not superior speed. At Sun, we used to joke how it's faster to uh, find internal Sun sites using Google than to use Sun internal search tools. So, what will be the next opportunity to increase productivity and how can Google benefit from it? In spite of all the past advances in speed and ease of use, what is possible to numerically compute has remained fixed for almost 45 years since about 1964 when IBM introduced floating point arithmetic. Shall I repeat that? For almost 45 years, what's possible to compute has remained static, fixed. Why? Because a fixed precision floating point number contains no information about its accuracy. None. Word length has nothing to do with accuracy. In fact, people can argue, and I have argued, that prior to digital computing, Astronomers and engineers that used, did computing with paper and pencil knew more about the accuracy of what they were computing than we do now. We're very fast, but we have almost no information about accuracy. So what are some of the consequences of this? This is why numerical analysts at the time, back in 1964, warned that switching from fixed point to floating point arithmetic was a mistake because doing so you threw away information about accuracy. This is also why in the Fortran standard <clears throat> there is not one word about numerical accuracy even for the result of evaluating an integer expression. In addition this is also why symbolic and numerical computing have diverged into separate products Symbolic computing automates mathematical proofs. Without great difficulty, nothing can be mathematically proved using only floating point arithmetic. Finally, this is also why computer manufacturers include disclaimers and customer warnings in their hardware and software products that they are not designed for mission critical applications in which there might be serious or even life threatening consequences. So exactly how inaccurate can floating point computations be? There's a famous example, at least in the interval community, due to a man named Rump in Germany. And the problem is to uh, evaluate, uh-oh, I pushed the wrong button, evaluate this little expression f of a and b where a is this integer, b is this integer, and all the constants in the expression for f are machine representable. Okay, so there's no rounding errors on input. Everything is exactly machine representable to start with. Now, conventional wisdom, which I'm sure most of you have heard, is that, <clears throat> well, if you're worried about accuracy, do it in double precision and see if you get the same answer. And the assumption is that if you get the same answer in double that you got in single, then you're safe. Well, in this example, using IEEE 754 round to nearest floating point arithmetic, you get in single precision this answer, in double precision this answer, notice this rounds to the same value, and then in quadruple precision you get exactly the same answer. All right. So it must be right then. Well, no, unfortunately the sign is wrong. <laughs> okay? The answer is negative. So what this illustrates is that you can't trust conventional wisdom and that in one seemingly innocuous 
expression evaluation, you can lose all your accuracy. You can start out with every input value being exactly machine representable and lose it all. Now, while this is a contrived example to illustrate a point, uh, it does illustrate how risky finite precision floating point computations can be and that conventional wisdom can't be trusted. Even small rounding errors can silently accumulate and compound through what's known as catastrophic cancellation to create essentially unbounded and unseen errors. I mean, the worst kind of an error is a silent one. That, I mean, I'd re you'd rather have your machine crash and burn and blow up than to have just a wrong answer and no warning at all that it's, that it's bad. So unlike this rump example, real life uncontrived floating point errors can be costly. Um, in this example, uh, all the Patriot missiles failed to hit a single incoming Scud in the first Gulf War. In one case, 28 U.S. soldiers were killed. The cause was a catastrophic floating point cancellation followed by uh, uh, following a routine rounding error. Another example is uh, this Ariane 5 French rocket that failed on its maiden liftoff. Its development cost was $7 billion. Its payload cost a half a billion. Its crash was caused by a floating point to integer conversion error that nobody detected. Many more real, uncontrived examples can be found on the internet. And by the way, if you get a copy of the slides, all of these uh, URLs here are hot if you have a, a decent reader. So you just click on them and they'll pop up on the internet. Um, the, the root cause of all of these failures is the fact that floating point numbers contain no accuracy information. If they did, when people were developing the software, they'd see the problem. This is why the focus in the industry is always on speed. You can see speed, you experience speed. You never experience accuracy because it's not in your face. There's nothing to see. That's one of the beauties of interval arithmetic is it makes accuracy visible. Because of this, increased speed can cause increased risk. There are more and more opportunities for unseen numerical problems. A petascale machine performs thousands of trillions of floating point operations per second. So think of the opportunities for numerical problems to arise. As in the rump example, rounding followed by cancellation can occur even when all inputs to computations are exact. Typically, they're not. Almost all scientific and engineering computations begin with fallible data that come from physical and or other measurements. So what's the solution to these problems? Well, anybody who knows me will not be surprised um, that the answer is interval arithmetic. Very briefly, interval arithmetic is a method of computing in which every interval is guaranteed to contain the set of all possible answers in any computation. So to start with, an interval, uh, pushed the wrong button, an interval denoted A, B, like one, two, is the set of all values between and including, including the endpoints of an interval. So there's nothing mysterious about that. What interval arithmetic does is uh, perform operations on intervals in such a way that the resulting interval is guaranteed to contain the set of all possible values for, for, from performing the operation in question on any element of the argument intervals. And operationally, on the machine, if, for example, this lower bound is not machine representable, I mean, say A is 1 and C is 10 to the minus 50, right? So it falls off the accumulator. So when that happens, what you must do is round down to the next machine representable number that's known to be less than A plus C. Similarly, the upper bounds always have to be greater than or equal to the true upper bound of whatever the computation is you're performing. Mm -hmm. 
So the, 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 the very basics of interval arithmetic are really quite simple and straightforward. Uh, again, if we have more time at the end, I'll be happy to, to, to go into more uh, details. Uh, uh, <clears throat> but for now, let's uh, plow ahead. One of the most important things about uh, intervals is the ability to represent uncertainty or error in input values. Uh, and there are, there are basically five ways that intervals work in order to solve all these problems that I mentioned with floating point arithmetic and solve other problems uh, in addition. First, intervals are constructed to, on input to be bounds on whatever your input values are. So, you know, price of gasoline this year, somewhere between 250 and 450 uh, a gallon. Uh, so that's an example of, of an input where you don't have much uh, certainty to begin with. But nevertheless, any computation you do with that interval takes that fact into account rigorously throughout the entire computation. A more subtle example is an input value like 0 0.1 that's not machine representable. The decimal number 0 0.1 isn't machine representable. So when you enter 0 0.1, then <clears throat> the compiler needs to construct a binary interval that is as narrow as possible and contains that true decimal value. Okay, so that's the kind of mechanics that needs to be built in uh, to tools, compilers, uh, uh, for people to work with. If input values are stochastic, say you've got some probability distribution, then what people are doing is using what are called probability boxes or P boxes which are interval bounds on cumulative distribution functions. And then they use interval arithmetic to rigorously compute functions of random variables bounded by those interval cumulative distribution functions. So this enables people numerically to do statistical distribution theory that is impossible to do analytically. I mean, I'm a statistician by training and so you know Gaussian linear you know that's kind of it for a, a lot of the statistical theory uh, but this enables you to uh, do, do uh, lots and lots of distribution calculations that would be impossible otherwise and do them rigorously. Second item, all arithmetic operations and elementary functions of intervals are constructed to produce mathematically valid interval bounds guaranteed to contain the correct result, or the set of correct results if there's more than one. The third item is the fact that an interval is a continuum of real values. This continuum property means that when a valid interval bound on a computation is produced, information is provided over the infinite set of values in the argument intervals, not just machine representable points. Okay, that's a real important point. Just because the endpoints of an interval are machine representable floating point numbers doesn't limit the fact that that interval represents the whole continuum. And so through an interval, you have access to information that normally you are totally, is totally inaccessible on the computer because normally the only thing you have access to is this finite set of machine representable numbers. And the derivations of all interval arithmetic operations and functions takes that into account. So the fourth item is what's known as the fundamental theorem of interval analysis. And it guarantees that <clears throat> using interval arithmetic to perform any programmable computation on a computer produces valid interval bounds. In other words, valid interval bounds are produced by concatenating interval operations. So you can take any sequence of oper numerical operations, and if you've implemented them using valid interval operations or elementary functions, then the result, no matter what it is, is guaranteed to be a, a valid interval bound on the set of all possible results that you could have gotten uh, by performing that computation. Fifth item, together, the continuum property and the fundamental theorem 
are the basis for numerical algorithms to fully solve nonlinear problems that have always been thought to be numerically unsolvable in principle. In other words, that there would never be a way to solve, numerically solve nonlinear problems. Chief among these is solving nonlinear systems of equations and globally solving optimization problems. An optimization problem is to find the minimum of some function. And global, globally optimizing some function is finding the global minimum, the minimum of all the minimums. Uh, the design of anything can be viewed as an unconstrained or constrained optimization problem. So this is an extremely important class of nonlinear problems. Now this next chart <clears throat> can be used to illustrate the, the continuum idea and the uh, fu fundamental theorem. If I evaluate this function over this interval, here's the function, and I get a lower bound, upper bound, what it says is that no matter where I am in this interval, whether it's a machine representable point or not, the function may not go below this lower bound and may not go above that upper bound. I've trapped it. All right. And this is true for any function that I can create from any sequence of operations that I can program on a computer. Okay. Or in mathematical terms, it's a, a um, composition. Okay. F of G of X. Uh, now the, the optimization algorithm works the following way. Suppose I found this local minimum here and I evaluated the function at or near that minimum value and I got this green lower upper bound for the function at that point. So it's some, some place, it doesn't matter where, that I've got this upper bound, least upper bound on the objective function, this function so far. And whenever I get some new lower upper bound, I save it. Because here's what I can do. When I evaluate the function over this interval, and if the lower bound over this interval is higher than the least upper bound that I've ever seen so far, what have I done? I've proved that the global minimum can't be in the blue interval. Because everywhere in the blue interval is greater than some value I know. So I can delete the blue interval, never have to look at it, it's gone. And the, globally, the algorithm works by proving where the solution can't be, by deleting, 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 and then subdividing, and deleting, and deleting, and deleting, until what you're left with is a small interval or a small set of intervals that uh, have to contain the, the, the global solution. And another important point about this is that if I have a problem and I subdivide the solution space up into subintervals or subboxes if it's multidimensional, and I send them to different processors, every processor just gets a new problem, just like the original problem, only it has a, a subset of the original domain of possibilities to work with. So I can subdivide, 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 and it's an embarrassingly parallel process where the amount of communication required between processors is minuscule relative to the work being done by each processor. So uh, the kind of large parallel architectures that we're blessed with these days, I just love because I know exactly what to do with them. Here is a little example of a, uh, an optimization problem uh, it's this little, uh, uh, do it again, this little function here, you're trying to minimize over the interval x in the interval minus one to one and the interval y in the interval minus one to one. It's got a lot of oscillations and local minimum because of all the sines and cosines in this expression. And these three pictures are just zooming in on where the uh, global minimum is. Uh, the actual answer is here to more than 10 decimal digits for x and y and the value of f. And it was done uh, in less than two seconds on a single Sunblade 1000. So the algorithm works, okay? And you can use it. A 
interesting aside, um, Russians, I used to manage Russian projects for, for Sun, part of one of my jobs. And I had a contact with uh, one of them who's translating a, a book I co-authored with Eldon Hansen into Russian. And they are in the process of using um, the solution to nonlinear systems of equations to design a Russian air traffic control system. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd prefer to fly under an interval-based air traffic control system than a floating point one. Uh, the idea is you have all the telemetry for a plane, which is uncertain, right? But you can create a cone of uncertainty out in front of every plane about where it's going to be in time. And if two cones don't intersect, they're safe. But if they do, then you need to take some kind of action. So that's, that's the idea behind it. Now, there are a number of different applications <clears throat> that, have, that have been done, uh, some of reasonable industrial strength. And again, every one of these URLs is hot if you get a copy of the slides. Don't have time to talk about all of these right now unless we have time at the end, but there's two that I'd like to, to mention in particular. One is this graphics rendering algorithm. <clears throat> um, it's poised to completely eliminate any DirectX-based polygon triangle rendering algorithm. Okay? It's much faster and produces picture quality uh, uh, rendering. Now, this, is, this means Pixar and everybody gets blown away. But this little upstart company that's now in beta. And it's all interval-based. And the way it works is <clears throat> that the problem for rendering is to decide on what red, green, blue intensity should be for each pixel in your display device. Right. So with intervals, what you do is you compute bounds on red, green, blue intensity for every pixel. And once those bounds are narrower than the resolution of the display device, you're done. You know more work to do. Doesn't matter what you do from, from then on. You can't help because the display device, display device's resolution is stopping you. Okay, so you've got a little handheld device, a Game Boy with not much resolution. You don't have to do much work. You know, you've got a fancy uh, um, iPhone, you know, with more resolution. Then you've got to do more work. But the point is, you don't do unnecessary work, and you know when to quit. Um, See, what, was there something else I wanted to say about that? Um, I think that's it. Um, they're in, the, in their first release, what they've got is, is motion blur with local illumination. For those of you who are graphics people, motion blur is, you know, you've got a shutter on a camera. It's open for, you know, a tenth of a second or so. If something's moving fast, then it, you get a blurred image. Well, this causes fits for the people using traditional rendering tools uh, like 3D Studio Max and whatever. They, they have to do all kinds of hand massaging in order to get things to look right. That's why you see casts of thousands at the end of, of uh, Ratatouille and other movies. You know, it's all these guys doing hand massaging of, of things to get them to look right. Well, with intervals, all that goes away. It's automatic. You get perfect motion blur, motion blur on the shadow uh, of things too. Um, let's see, their key to, sp uh, key to speed is knowing uh, when there's no more quality to be achieved. Uh, the key to quality is knowing the red, green, blue intensity of your display device. Um, okay, the second example is, that I want to talk about is this uh, numerical proofs. And there have been a number of numerical proofs that have been done using intervals. Now these are real mathematical proofs. Uh, the first one is called Smale's 14th problem. Uh, and it's to prove that the Lorenz differential equation has a so-called strange attractor, for those of you who know about that kind of thing. Uh, the problem is one of a set of selected uh, to be the most important mathematical problems to be solved in the 21st century. And this was the first one of the set to be solved, and it was solved using interval arithmetic. 
Uh, the next one is Kepler's conjecture. It was the oldest outstanding unproved conjecture in discrete mathematics. Uh, and it was proved using, using intervals. It's about stacking spheres like they have in, in, in uh, oranges in a grocery store, that that's the, the, the densest way that you can pack spheres. Originally, the generals gave it to Kepler because they were tired of counting cannonballs by picking them up and moving them. They wanted to build a stack, measure the size of the stack, and know how many cannonballs they had in the stack. So he came up with this conjecture about what the number was, but nobody could prove it. And it wasn't proved until the late 90s uh, using intervals. And finally, the double bubble conjecture and that's that this uh, soap bubble with a membrane in between is the, has the smallest surface area that contains, that has two compartments and contains a given volume. And proving that uh, had to be done using, using intervals. So in addition to solving all the floating point problems that we talked about, intervals can open the door to numerical computing productivity by permitting numerical proofs to exist with nonlinear solvers and by permitting problems to be stated and solved at a higher level of abstraction. Because if an engineer can solve his design optimization problem by just writing down the equations that define the problem, he's done. So as with computing in general, productivity is the ultimate figure of merit for numerical computing. Raising the level of abstraction in which people can work and think is exactly what can be done with interval, nonlinear, and other solvers. Numerical pro pro productivity is difficult without the guaranteed accuracy information provided by intervals. So this has not been... Uh, totally unnoticed. Uh, there have been some early adopters. Sun, Intel, Maple, uh, Mathematica, MATLAB. Um, so given the fact that there are these huge potential benefits for computing with intervals, huge problems with floating point arithmetic, there are existence proofs that huge successes are possible computing with intervals, and the fact that this has been recognized by people like this. Why has computing with intervals not taken off like a rocket? The difficulty is that computing with intervals is still hard. It's difficult. Why? There are some things that are missing. Most potential users don't even know that computing with intervals exists. Some of you might not have <laughs> before you came here today. Uh, there are no introductory textbooks with included software and examples. Interval successes have tended to be rather technical. I mean, Schmale's 14th problem isn't going to make you know, the popular press. Um, so they have not hit mainstream press. As mentioned, Graphics rendering might be the first application that makes a splash in the regular press because when people see some new movie that's, you know, whiz-bang much better than anything that they've seen before, that might get people's attention. Developing this, so the second reason is that developing practically useful interval applications and algorithms is still too difficult. It can, it can require interval and numerical analysis expertise that the typical application developer does not possess. Finally, end users who are f unfamiliar with interval computing <coughs> can find it difficult to access interval uh, methods and tools. Well-designed and implemented web-based tools to make computing with intervals as accessible as games do not yet exist. So how can Google, I mean, I've set this up. So how can Google benefit from changing the interval computing potential into a practical reality? By providing interval computing to end users and developers of numerical computing algorithms. I was talking to Bill just before this morning. Uh, I was thinking about this, this difficulty, and I came up with the idea that where we are with intervals 
computing right now is sort of like in the 60s and 70s with ARPANET and the internet before there was a browser. You know, if you talk to people about, well, what's the demand for the internet? You know, I say, oh, well, you know, there's some guys, you know, sending messages, text messages with, with this thing, but it's, you know, kind of hard to, you have to be a geek to use it, you know. You have to get a tip, that's right. You have to get a tip, for those of you who remember that. Um, and, um, uh, but they didn't see the browser coming, okay? And so I think that where we are with intervals, with all of this pent up opportunity being blocked by lack of access is exactly analogous. The potential user base can start with every junior high school student in the world who has access to the internet and who needs to compute truly useful and realistic answers to homework problems. Students love to know more than their teachers about new technology. That's one of the reasons the computers are so cool for, for young kids is they know more than, their, than adults about computing. Similarly, upstart companies and even countries love to leapfrog the establishment using knowledge and tech, new knowledge and technology. Google can be the provider. There's no upper limit to the level of user and developer sophistication or to the complexity of problems to be solved. Numerically solving nonlinear problems in many different disciplines led me in one paper to conclude that computing with intervals is the mother of all paradigm shifts. It's a paradigm shift in applied mathematics, numerical analysis, numerical computing, as well as all of the disciplines that use numerical computing. Every engineering discipline, science. Uh, the new and technically sophisticated eyeballs, thereby attracted, if this were to happen, should fit nicely into Google's business model, although I hasten to add, your business model is not my area of expertise. So, if the above is even partly true, what I've outlined so far, what's required to realize this potential, both for Google and for safe numerical computing in the world? Well, it turns out there's only eight things, but some already exist, so it's, it's not really that bad. Okay, first, at the present time, uh, hardware support for set-based interval instructions is not required. And I'll say a minute, in a minute what I mean by set-based. Nevertheless, as demand for interval computing speed intensifies, the business justification for interval hardware support will become compelling. Set-based interval instructions permit symbolic and numerical computing to be united. If time permits, I can answer some questions about this. It, one really interesting and important thing it does is eliminates all exceptions because there are no undefined set-based interval operations or functions. Division by zero, operations on infinity, they're all defined. There are no exceptions. So all the hardware and software exception handling apparatus can be thrown away in that kind of a system. And what it does is it makes it safe to bring symbolic mathematics inside a compiler. Let Maple diddle with your expressions safely. The reason you can't do that is for fear of creating a, uh, a, an exception that's a, um, the result of a singularity or an indeterminate form. So I'm slipping into that area that I won't have probably much time to talk about. Okay, so second item, language support. That syntax and semantics for interval data types will be required. Work on this has already been done in Fortran, C++, and MATLAB. These can serve as templates with some small additions for this set-based interval data type. So this is essentially done. Okay, so the hardware isn't needed to begin with, and the language, syntax, and semantics have already been defined. Compiler support in Fortran, C, C++, other popular languages, and in symbolic systems, including Mathematic and Maple, are critical. In other words, you want interval data types in the symbolic packages as well. Uh, this can be accomplished by the open source community and GNU compilers. Existence proofs already are available in SUNS. 
support for interval data types in Fortran C++. Other academic implementations exist, for example, in MATLAB and Excel. The work can be done with little cost by open source interval enthusiasts. In this connection, many opportunities exist to hide the use of nonlinear solvers under simple, familiar tools such as a spreadsheet. The fact that Microsoft is rumored to be adding interval support to Excel and that you now have a spreadsheet product creates an interesting opportunity. Fourth item, an integrated mathematical development environment. In other words, most of the IDEs are Java-based, and you know, for those kind of there's not a, an integrated mathematical uh, development environment <clears throat> with which libraries, mathematical software can be developed, documented, and maintained. Because this will increase the productivity both of interval and non-interval mathematical software developers. This can be a model for good application user interface design and implementation. And the next item is based on that set-based stuff. Static at compile time and dynamic at runtime integration of symbolic and numerical computing. Set-based interval instructions make this possible. It will make the task of developing high-quality solver libraries and end-user applications less time-consuming. Solver libraries, the sixth item is solver libraries using the best available interval algorithms to solve frequently occurring mathematical engineering problems. This will make the task of end user application developers less time consuming and demanding of interval analysis expertise. The seventh item is lots of end user applications. The interval graphics rendering algorithm mentioned earlier is an exemplar. It can seamlessly replace existing rendering engines so end users are oblivious to the change except of course for the increased speed and superior image quality they experience. And the last item is the educational materials in the form of online and physical books with software and sample codes that can be downloaded, executed, and cloned. These can target various user groups starting with junior high school students who want to become interval application end users and or developers. Before concluding, let me say just a few words about these eight items. The language support, compiler support, and educational materials with end user software are sort of must have items to begin demand creation for computing with intervals. You have to get people teaching this stuff in school and universities. The, IM, the integrated mathematical development environment, uh, compiler optimization, solver libraries, and other applications can be developed in parallel. However, the sooner the integrated mathematical development environment is available, the sooner it will speed the development of solver libraries and applications. Interval application success stories need to be widely publicized and educational materials need to be kept current as new tools and solvers become available. So in conclusion, it seems to me, seems to clear to me that there is a large opportunity for Google to use its traditional expertise to provide high quality easy to use access to numerical computing with intervals. In the process, Google can acquire large numbers of technical eyeballs and create newsworthy events in the process of fomenting the mother of all paradigm shifts. I'd be happy to take your questions. Yeah. A couple questions. First sure. of all, um, Hi there. A couple questions. Um, so first of all, uh, just a technical question. What happens if my interval contains a singularity? Ah, well, let's take a look at uh, division by zero, one sure. over zero. Okay. So I have an interval, start, start with an interval no, no, that no, just no, spans no, no. Just, zero. Just, just okay. one over zero. Okay. Okay, so a degenerate interval. Sure. Degenerate interval one, degenerate interval zero. What is it? Well, think of one over x. If x approaches zero from the positive side, you go up to plus infinity. If you go approach zero from the negative side, you go to minus infinity. So it's not that one over zero is undefined, it's the union of plus and minus infinity, okay? Which is a set, it's not a point. 
The reason singularities and indeterminate forms are undefined is because they're trapped in a point system where the answer to everything has to be a point. It's like, like asking a flatlander to visualize something in 3D. Okay? But intervals are sets. So in principle, there's no problem representing the result of a singularity or an indeterminate form, like zero divided by zero or plus infinity divided by plus infinity, representing those using intervals. And that's the fundamental answer to your question, I okay, believe. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Uh, the other question is, yeah. if an interval is a range of two numbers, what types do you envision those, those individual numbers as being? Uh, or does it matter? Well, no, they, typically what you do or what we've done so far is you have single precision uh, intervals, double precision intervals, and you know, quad precision intervals. So their endpoints are floating point. You could also think of having integer intervals where the endpoints are integers and you'd always you know, round to the next integer if you want when you were performing some operation. And there, there are contexts in which that turns out to be uh, handy. Uh, See if I can dredge it up. It's in um, uh, temporal. Uh, um, what are the things? The, anyway, it, 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 time things tend to be. If you model time in days, okay, then it's discrete, okay. So then, if you uh, use integer intervals, then that turns out to be handy. Okay. Yes. You've mentioned but the uh, typical high school, st uh, school student as a potential target. Yes. Let's take Rob's example you had before. I'm putting a, uh, using a floating point library for interval arithmetics. I put this in and I get back the result is somewhere between, let's say, minus 100 and plus 100. How as a high school student would I uh, like that compared to using a symbolic library that gives me back the exact result? Well, you're assuming, are you assuming that the inputs are intervals or? I'm, I'm assuming I'm using uh, one of the libraries you mentioned, and they're usually based on IEEE, so you're rounding up and down. So if you have a nasty function like ROP, you get, your intervals get very big, they inflate very quickly. Right. The, which has been the problem with, you know, uh, layman's adopting uh, interval arithmetics for many decades. Right. Part of the, of what's needed here is tools to use sophisticated analysis that the user doesn't have to know about to eliminate unnecessarily wide interval results. I mean, his question, to repeat, was, you know, are pe aren't people going to be unhappy when they do some computation and get, you know, really huge wide intervals? Well, the question is whether that's what they should get or whether those, that interval width is, is unnecessary. Right? And what you want to do is, in the tools, eliminate the unnecessary interval width so you get nice sharp bounds and hide the complexity of doing that from the users. And that's part of what I'm assuming gets done in making these tools available and easy to use. Does that answer your question? On, on, the other hand, on the other hand, suppose you have a numerical instability. Suppose you have an expression that is very, very numerically unstable because it's written in a bad way. Well, you want interval arithmetic to expose that so that you could say, oh my God, I lost all my, all my uh, accuracy. What's wrong? Is there a way to reformulate this expression so that it's uh, numerically stable and I don't lose all my accuracy? The question is whether you want to be ignorant about what's going on uh, or do you want to be informed? Yeah, but then again, you're getting Right? But it, it, there's so much that can be done to make computing with intervals so much more easy than it is now, and thereby greatly expand its accessibility. That, uh, I mean, the opportunities, from my perspective, are just gargantuan. Question? Yeah, what about uh, complex numbers and neighborhood oh. computing? Right. And, and what? Neighborhood computing, rather Na than an interval, a neighborhood of a complex number. Ah, right. Um, with uh, complex, you, you can represent complex numbers in a couple different ways. Uh, the real and imaginary parts, or magnitude and phase, but whichever way you want to do it, or both, you can uh, use intervals uh, to, to bound that set. Now, 
one of the things, so magnitude uh, with a real and complex, a, a complex interval is just a box in the complex plane, right? And so one of the things that, that gets interesting about working with uh, complex intervals is the so-called wrapping effect. In other words, if you take a, a box that has sides parallel to the real and imaginary axis and you rotate it, then the new box has to grow to accommodate that rotation, okay? So there's been a lot of work done with uh, Taylor expansions and, and different techniques to avoid the so-called wrapping effect. But again, this is the kind of thing that can be put, in fact, that, that technique was used in that first example for uh, modeling the largest particle beam accelerator in the world. And they had these huge differential equations to integrate over 3,000 turns of a particle and keep everything under control and they're able to do it using this Taylor modeling uh, technique and using intervals. So, um, and I'd, I'm not exactly familiar with what you mean by neighborhood uh, uh, computing, but let me say one thing about branch cuts. Branch cuts are really interesting because when you have an interval that spans a branch cut, then you want to allow it gracefully to, to cross over. So it turns out that you need, and this is even not in complex, but just with trig functions and stuff, you need to allow for interval angles to go from something less than uh, minus pi to something greater than, uh, than uh, minus pi, and conversely, from something greater than pi to something uh, uh, greater than, uh, something less than pi to something greater than pi. So you've got to allow for both possibilities and do all of this kind of work under the cover seamlessly so users don't have to deal with it. Um, but it, it, it's, once you start doing it, the, the, the power of the system and having all of the knowledge that you have about what's going on is, I mean, you can never go back to floating point once you've computed with intervals. It's, it's completely addicting. Yes? In your example about the airing pie, yes. you mentioned that the problem was, a, the problem was conversion from float to an inappropriately sized to an inappropriately sized integer. Mm -hmm. And I guess the question that, that I have is if you were to have used interval arithmetic, I'm assuming, again, the, the target integer size would remain the same. How would this have prevented the resulting failure from the overflow? Because I'd be using integer intervals. But the, the and so I would see the, 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 the interval width, and if I had, if, if the if the word length of my integers was too small to represent the floating point value, then I would, you know, blow up. I'd get, you know, minus infinity to infinity uh, as an answer, and I would see immediately that I had a problem. What happened to them was they had a large floating point value. They mapped it into an integer. It wrapped around, changed the sign, and, you know, they had no clue that, that they had complete garbage in what they'd done. This is part of the reason why there's no requirements for accuracy, even for integers in the Fortran standard. I mean, originally that came from control data because they had a 17-bit uh, loop index and they had a 60-bit word and so, but they had this, uh, or it was a 48-bit, 48-bit uh, loop index register that they used, but they, they weren't careful about converting back and forth. And so when it came time to discuss in the IEEE, or in the Fortran standard meeting, well, what about an integer? At least an integer accuracy requirement. So CDC said, no, 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 we can't have that. And so that's sort of the way that club works. You know, you have least common denominator and nobody, nobody does anything that rattles the cage uh, for any other vendor. But I'm not sure how it would have changed that outcome because what you're describing is that, okay, if the, if the interval is set to indicate that you're grossly out of bounds, um, similarly with, with testing, they could have noticed at some point that they had a negative value for an integer. So sure, I'm not sure how it would have changed the outcome of the flight. If they t but what you would do, if you were doing interval programming in that situation, you'd have, first you'd have an interval for the floating point value, right? And you'd have, integer intervals for the, for the integer value, and you would naturally put in the, the, the check to say, well, what happens when I can't represent 
uh, this uh, a bound on the floating point value with my integer intervals. Okay, because what you would do, and the conversion routines would automatically return minus infinity, infinity for the integer interval when you, can, when you couldn't do the conversion. So you'd, you'd, have, you'd naturally put an if statement. You know, if you know, the integer interval is, has I infinite width, then you know, I've got a problem. And you, you do some, you'd, you'd, you'd increase the word length for the integer, right? Or do, do, do something appropriate. The, 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 I mean, the problem is that when, when you have the information available about what's going on and it's in your face, the natural thing to do is then to, to, to deal with the different possible contingencies. What happens now with floating point is that you're not forced to think about uh, what can happen. Let me give you another example. Suppose you have a sequence of relational tests, if then else kinds of things. Uh, when, with relational tests on intervals, uh, what you do is you set them up so that if an interval is empty, there's such a thing as an empty interval. And if I take the intersection of two intervals and they're disjoint, then you get the empty interval like the empty set. Okay? So any relational test on an interval that's empty is false. Right? So I have a, an exhaustive sequence of relational tests. Exhaustive in the sense that I've taken into account every logical possibility. And then there's an else at the end. Okay, now that else should never happen. Except if one of the argument intervals is empty. And then that's exactly what happens, is you fall through to the, to the else case. But, you know, you, you, you're not normally provided with those kinds of tools uh, to build fail-safe programming. Hi. Um, so I'm wondering a couple of things. One is that um, you were saying how uh, the result of the division by zero, one over zero is going to give you plus and minus infinity. Uh, but this interval is going to include all points in between. So does that cause any problems down the line? Here's the way we deal with that. <laughs> um, there's such a thing as an exterior interval that wraps around through plus and minus infinity. Okay, and that's exactly what happens when you divide by an interval containing zero. So suppose I take one over the interval minus one plus one. Okay, what is it? Well, I, first of all, a way to think about this is to say, well, I'm dividing by the interval, the union of the interval minus one to zero and zero to plus one, right? So crack those apart. So what's the first one? Well, the first one is the, the interval from minus one to minus infinity. The other one is the interval from plus one to plus infinity. Take the union of those two is this exterior interval. You represent it on the machine by just flipping the endpoint so that when the left hand point is greater than the right end point, then that's an exterior interval that wraps around through plus and minus infinity, okay? So, so, the, so the answer then to one divided by zero using an exterior interval is the interval plus infinity comma minus, minus infinity, okay? It's, it, it's sitting right there at the, at the top of the projective circle, you know what? Um, I also have one other question. Just sure. To, um, it seems like you could think of these intervals as being just, you know, probability distributions, right? A uniform distribution over this range. So then why not just think about distributions generally and go for them? They're not, that? though. Okay. Because the, 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 a uniform distribution is very different than an interval. An interval says that you have no information about the distribution. Everything can be at one endpoint, everything can be at the other endpoint, or any kind of distribution in between. So they're not uniform distributions. All right, now if you want to work with uniform distributions, then you can with these probability boxes. Uh, but it, but uh, that's a mistake some people have, have, have made. An interval has no information about the, the distribution uh, uh, of what's going on inside the interval. However, let me, let me just mention one other thing, that there's this so-called dependence problem. That, in other words, if I have the interval x minus the interval x, Okay, I have to treat that as if it were the interval x minus y. In other words, like they're constants or, or two separate intervals. But what if I really have the interval x minus x? 
where the interval x stands for some value that's wandering around inside that interval, mm -hmm. okay? The interval x minus x, if I know that every occurrence of the interval x is dependent, right? Then the interval x minus x is zero, all right? Yeah. And I can take that into account with some language constructs where I declare intervals to have a dependence attribute mm -hmm. so that every occurrence of x is an interval that contains the same value. So they're dependent. Now, it's not statistically dependent, it's mathematically dependent, okay? But this is a huge thing because this dependence issue when things are really dependent but you don't get to assume that they are is a big source of this unnecessary interval width that he was talking about. And, uh, but the way to avoid it is to allow for intervals to be dependent. Yes, or I'm sorry, he, he, no, that, was exactly like that was your question? Okay, he, he's had a. Yeah, uh, you, mentioned, um, you mentioned relational operations on yes. intervals. Yes. Um, so what happens if you do okay. x less than y right. and right. they overlap? Right. There's three, three different kinds of relational operators when you start dealing with intervals. One is certainly, so if one interval is certainly greater than another, then there's no overlap, okay? If it's possibly greater, then there's at least a possibility of an element in one interval being greater than another, okay? So there's certainly, possibly, for all the different relations, and then when you write code, you need to say, with intervals, you need to say what it is you mean. You know, are you trying to protect yourself from something that possibly could happen, or are you wanting to guarantee that some state is true with respect to two intervals? So you, you write CLT for certainly less than, or PLT for possibly less than. Uh, then there's another, another kind that are set, set relational, so that two intervals are equal if they're set equal. So as sets, so there's, and so th those are all uh, documented and, and worked out, but it's a very good question and something that did cause some people some consternation to begin with. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. let me get the guys who haven't had a chance, yes. Um, when you mentioned the fundamental theorem yes. uh, to intervals, do you get back an interval or do you get back a collection of intervals? Uh, with the fundamental theory, well, de it depends on 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 what you what you're doing. Uh, when you divide when you divide by uh, an interval containing zero, then you can get two disjoint uh, disjoint intervals, and then depending upon how you want to pull them together uh, as an as an interior interval or an exterior interval or what you want to do, uh, you know, is your choice. The ideal thing to do would be to have another data type called sets of intervals so that you never had to include anything from taking the union or the hull of uh, two intervals and include anything that you didn't want to, to include. And that's perfectly consistent with these embarrassingly parallel algorithms where what you tend to do is split, 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 subdivide into lists of or sets of intervals and then operate on them. So uh, I don't see that as, uh, as, as any difficulty. The, the, the fundamental theorem originally applies to interval arithmetic operations where what you have in is intervals, what you get out is intervals, and uh, the, the, it works. But it, the extension of it to this new set-based stuff also, the, the, the fundamental theorem extends to this set-based uh, interval stuff in which you could get uh, a set of intervals as the result, or a set of values for that matter. And there was somebody back here had a question. So in first year physics, we learned about error bars, which has some resemblance, but it's not identical. So I'm just wondering about your thoughts of using that handle to introduce it. To error university. bars, you mean like epsilon delta in engineering? Or? No, for no. like, you, you run an experiment and you plot a graph, then you have a point and you draw a vertical bar, ah, ah, bounding ah, the ah, possible ah, values. Usually that's like a standard deviation, like one or two standard deviations in statistics when you do that. But if they were bounds, if those error bars represented bounds, then they would exactly be intervals. 
And then when you operate on them, you do some other tricks. So we learned a bunch of weird tricks that were strange. But I'm wondering if you can squeeze in introduction of interval arithmetic into such curriculums. Might be interesting. Don't, I, I don't know. There is a lot of work going on in the intersection of classical statistics and fuzzy logic and fuzzy arithmetic and intervals. So those three domains are sort of, you know, working together in a seething cauldron of, of new research. So th there might be something related to your question. Yes. Okay. So it seems to me that this is the kind of thing that would work a lot better in a statically typed language than in a dynamic language. And the reason is because in a late bound language, you know, each mathematical operation is happening somewhat in isolation, whereas in a statically language, you can sort of take an entire expression and analyze it. And it seems in order to do the, the kind of thing you're talking about both efficiently and properly, you need to look at the whole formula and not individual mathematical operations. Indeed. And one of the other at, uh, attributes, other than dependence, is uh, what I call a symbolic attribute. So if I declare a variable to be symbolic, and I have it to the left of an equal sign. What I'm saying is that I'm defining a macro for that variable. So if that variable appears later on, I can replace the variable by the expression that was to, 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 the, to its right in the assignment statement. And so then I can expand that expression and then do algebra on it to apply identities, uh, do cancellation analytically, rearrange it in different ways. And one of the tricks, for example, that people do with uh, intervals is you can rearrange an expression in different ways and they have very different numerical characteristics. So one way will have a, a sharp lower bound and a very loose upper bound. And another expression will have a sharp upper bound and a loose lower bound. And so you do them both, take the intersection. Okay? So there's all kinds of tricks that interval analysts have developed over the years, but now they're in their heads. They're not automated in tools. And all of this can be automated, and it can be automated safely because of this set-based uh, interval system where there are no exceptions, no singularities or indeterminate forms. So, so in other words, you're saying that, that a lot of uh, the efficiency comes from being able to do lazy calculations, yes. essentially. Yes, right. Okay, well that could be done in a dynamic language. Or, or you... even, at, even at runtime. I mean, yeah. you should be able to, see, because a lot of times I don't know how I want to rearrange an expression until I'm confronted with the interval endpoints that I'm using, that I'm evaluating it over, okay? So I have to wait, I can't do everything statically at compile time. I have to, I have to you know, use, JIT compiler type technology so that at runtime, I say, wait a minute, I've got this interval that straddles zero. And you know, so I, I need to do something different than uh, I, I would if it doesn't. Any more questions? Anybody else? Did, did, did I get your question answered? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, well, right. th thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you.